So today we're going to focus on the story of David, specifically into the 23rd Psalm, but we're going to back up a little bit before that. But really, even through the valley of the shadow of darkness, or in many versions, it actually says death, we know we're not alone. I think this is going to be a really interesting conversation today. So I want to start here with the United States Constitution, the preamble. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish a justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Now, is that beautiful? And yet, line by line, you can see those are being ripped apart. I want to explore a little bit here. We, we understand that you can have all the policies in the world, but if they're not followed, it doesn't mean anything. We have a great constitution with amendments to make it even better. And yet, for some reason, the leadership we have right now has decided, it's, I'm trying to choose a polite word now. It's just not the rules they're gonna follow. But what I wanted to point out, and I, I went through this in an, in an earlier conversation, that the government is, is not just a government, right? It is not just a government over there and something that isn't related to any of us making the rules. That's not how it works. The government is made up of people. Now we have the conversations around puppets and blackmail and yeah, I got that. But we really have to understand who those people are. We have civilian employees, right? So they come in their career they could be in for a few years. Many of them are, are for their entire 30 or 40 years of service and retire out of it. It's really the only cradle to grave opportunity that we have in the United States right now. And there's a, a level within that. You can get up in a GS level. You can get up to a level 12, a GS grade 12. That's um, pay grades. And, and you're still under that. You have to do what you're told. You get with each administration coming in, they have different bells you have to ring and, and ropes you have to hop and skip over. But if you keep your head down, you get that job and that's the reward, right? So this is the ultimate of the Peter principle. You stick around long enough, you get promoted one step above what you're capable of. And I tell you, these are not the most ambitious people on the planet. Everybody says the pay is not great. I beg to differ. The pay is very, very comparable in most areas, or at least areas I'm familiar with, of the civilian workforce. And in fact, they can move up grades quickly. People um, learn to manipulate that system for their friends. All uh, medical benefits are covered, although I do admit that the term of medical um, insurance now is, is degrading, but that's what we're seeing across the country. So here wouldn't be different than anywhere else. And then once you do this service as a civilian, you get a pension for the rest of your life. Now, prior to, I believe it was right about 2010, the pensions were structured very, very differently. Actually, it was it's prior to that. So 2000, it would have been about 2000, 2003-ish that this shifted. And so it became more of a hybrid where you invested some and you got some social security or some, it, it really was off the pension, but still the package is pretty nice. Who's the next group here? SES. This is a group that is very, very often overlooked. The senior executive staff, they are appointed by current administration. Now, if you've got a detailed administration, they're going to go in and wipe the slate with, um, with each new president and bring in their core individuals. But, you know, a, long, a lot of these people slip by for decades and decades. And there's one that we all know we have a face for is um, FAUCI, right? Senior executive staff. At some point, he had some tie to government, got played the games, hooked himself into these roles, and brought in money, renegotiated contracts. We've seen that none of that has been actually good for the United States or humanity. But there's a prime example. They are treated differently than the civilian employees. 
and offered excuses or offered um, bonuses or flagrantly take them beyond what is even allowed in, in policy rules or regulations. In fact, they don't like it. They usually write them themselves. And now we're at the point where why bother? I'll just make my own rules anyways. Then we have the military. And we all have a grasp on, on the depth of that. Then we have elected officials. Our constitution sets up a separation. So there's three main offices three main administrative realms, right? And people are appointed and or elected. And those that are elected, let's see if we look at uh, Congress, we've got some elected for four years, some elected for six years, and yet the president is only four years. So some of those individuals in the six-year term voted in life uh, time after time after time. You can see the amount of power that they have. And when the newbie shows up in the White House, who has control? This new person off the street with great ideas on what they're gonna change? Or the civilian employees that are gonna drag their feet because they wanna keep their job and they know that they can just write out this person for four years or eight years. Or the SES senior executive official that staff that did not get cleaned out the last time around and knows that they want the door to swing the other way. And then there's the military. People are policy. So what I want to do is take a look at really timely what's going on in the news right now. We have this agency. And it's very interesting if you go to their site, which I listed right down below, and then slide in a slash there, investigate, or you click on the, the opening. It's really interesting to go over the subjects that they investigate. I, I invite you to do that. But I listed a screenshot at the top here. And if you'll notice right now, if you go through each one of those line by line, they have put their fingers in the cookie car and gotten cookie jar and gotten caught in every single one of these areas. What is the core role of the FBI? Well, we all know it's to investigate, right? To investigate crimes. And once you investigate a crime, you identify the people in, involved and then you turn it over for a prosecution. They're the investigative arm. And as we've seen this year, it is their responsibility not to investigate people. You don't go after people and look for a crime. You have a crime and you look for the people. And yet in order for them to master what they're doing, they have become masters of deception and they are liars. They lie to themselves. They're told to lie to their family. They go undercover and they lie to those that they meet. Their whole lives between become one big blurry lie. And yet now that they've mastered the lies, they've mastered each one of these segments of society and the absolute corruption that occurs in each, you're seeing that they're messing around with each one of these on this list, terrorism, counterintelligence, cybercrime, public corruption, civil rights, organized, white collar, violent, they're, they're in the middle of all of this right now. And we know that because it keeps coming out. Day after day, we get a new story. And they're not even embarrassed, they're doubling down. And yet right there on their core website, it says, we protect the American people and uphold the US Constitution. I bet if you ask any of them what the Constitution is, they don't even know at this point. I don't mean in theory what it is, but could they even recite the preamble? Do they know any of the amendments? Or are they just not even things that get in the way anymore for them? They move beyond it. So what we do know out of the news is they're excellent in investigating parents at school board meetings because that's where you find the rough ones. Investigate false Russia probe, terrorizing J6 participants. Suppress laptop. They had this laptop for over a year before they went to social media and said, bury the story. And yes, it did come out this week that they were, it was the FBI that came to them and said, hey, be on a lookout of this one. And, and everybody with a wink and a nod knew what that meant. And then of course, the absolute boldness of raiding a US citizen 
over paperwork? I mean, come on, what world do we live in here? What are they investigating? They are investigating a person for a crime, not a crime for a person. People are policy. Now this was freaky. Any of you are website developers, you don't create an all black website. When I put in this site, I was shocked at, at the darkness. I mean, my skin started crawling looking at this. And the image, uh, which it was an image of a person, so I'm not gonna post it here, but just creepy. We are the nation's first line of defense. We accomplish what others cannot accomplish and go where others cannot go. You're right, they do, because they lie. They cheat, they steal, they make up their own words. And what we know is they are typically responsible for outside the borders of the United States, right? They handle things around the world protecting the United States and the FBI typically handles within our borders in the United States and DHS, Department of Homeland Security, is our borders, whether you're coming in by plane or boat or walking across the board. So that's kind of how that delineation is supposedly supposed to work. But you know what? There seems to be a challenge with our borders. And this agency has been known for years to have a trafficking trifecta. In fact, in an article that I talked about a couple days ago, they were actually referred to as a cartel. Don't you think they get angry if their border is messed with? Now we did learn that there is a distinction between what we have the DS and the, this other group, right? Although they're both very, very evil. They're not the same group. There's some overlap of principles. There's similar direction, but the core understanding of absolute destruction for one ruler is the same. But the idea of that ruler isn't the same. And we got the conversation loud and clear when Biden said that he was going to be the ruler. But we do know that evil ends because it attacks itself. Now, remember this gentleman who stood up in the scene? Absolute CIA connection. And these were the years of his presidency. Now, it's very interesting that as I study and I, I work with different individuals in the society that have gone through similar as myself, between these years, this is when most people slipped on a rug in society and never came back. This is when the brooks of people had their businesses attacked and, attacked and sold, got pulled into court on ridiculous reasons and lost, got attacked in the workplace, were moved from positions. The story goes on and on and on. And most of it actually happened right here around 2009 to 2012 seems to be the heart of what I hear from people. Absolute destruction ripping apart in people's lives. So if you know somebody in that period of time, perhaps it actually wasn't them that did something wrong although the blame was always put on the individual. So what do we have here? In 2002, the Department of Homeland Security was established and it combined 22 different federal departments and agencies into a unified integrated cabinet agency. So essentially, prior to this, there wasn't a lot of surveillance that was shared. Each county would have information, each city or state would have information. Well, so would all the different intelligence agencies. Here they're naming that 22 were rolled up in this one. So this got pulled together to start common databases and, and um, control, really, right? And this was allowed after this incident that happened, right? We lost a lot of rights, and this was part of what was already ready to go at that time. Now, what we do know is the statement of the signing of this act was um, in 2002, and it was by this president. Seriously, nobody believed the strength at this time. And in fact, this story shows a weakness in his own, his own cabinet, because even if that did happen, which I don't have evidence one way or another, that's not something that would get leaked out or told. Like who tells a story like this? If you're trying to protect the, the most powerful man on the planet at the time, as far as they're concerned. Is this the kind of story you want to get out? But no, it shows the level of idiocy that this guy had. 
And yet, when you're put into place and your strings are pulled, you're more than happy to do what you're told. Oh, look at this one. We all remember this one. And here it is. 76 to 77, director of this agency. Right? Did daddy tell him to do it? So this is not an accident. You're reading this correctly. Psychopathy. Psychopathy is a neuropsychiatric disorder marked by deficient emotional response, lack of empathy, and poor behavioral controls, commonly resulting in persistent antisocial deviance and criminal behavior. This is right from the NIH.gov site. Isn't that interesting? Who else works for the NIH? Narcissistic personality disorder. This is from the Mayo Clinic. Narcissistic personality disorder, one of several types of personality disorders, is a mental condition in which people have an inflated sense of their own importance, a deep need for excessive attention and admiration, troubled relations, and lack, lack of empathy for others. But behind this mass of a string confidence, so you can, you can go on there if you want more. They, they do, they stand up as leader, extremely confident. You know, it's often, you know, on a smaller scale, actors are like this, right? On a stage, they're bold and bright and brilliant in front of the cameras. And yet in person, historically, actors have usually been kind of quiet and reserved. They had gone into that profession initially to put a mask on and be somebody else because they weren't comfortable in their own skin. But in this case, we all know these faces, they're better than you. So why did I bring up those two? Because people are policy. We have said that the nuts are running the, the nut house right now. Policy doesn't matter if the people are literally psychopaths. So once again, I talked about the border and I really think that there's a lot of issues going on here. Everything's rolled in here. I think that there's a turn on another. If you are leading an intelligence agency, you wanna outdo that agency. And not today you wanna get up and, and make a change or be better, but long-term, this is a long-term. Have you ever gone to a high school, university or professional ball game? Those rivals run deep. Some people don't even know why the rival started other than at one day, somebody identified that one year, somebody identified them as a rival and off they were running. And there's absolute hatred, sometimes egg being thrown, um, toilet paper, and it can get really aggressive. And yet, if in fact, this other agency was in charge of monitoring by doing it themselves, traffic over the borders, and we know the trifecta of what, what was brought in, and then all of a sudden, somebody else says, wait a minute, you have too much control. I want a piece of the pie. Can there be more of a conflict there? So here, I do direct uh, you to Oscar Blue. He's on YouTube. He monitors the borders, both the northern border of Mexico, which is, of course, the southern border of the United States, and the southern border of Mexico with Guatemala as well, and does a phenomenal job interviewing and marching with the, the um, migrants and really understanding the whole picture. But then down below here, I'm gonna point out in just this very month, there was video of border patrol opening gates that were locked by the Texas National Guard, right? They were locking the gate saying, no more, we can't handle it. After they had sent buses up to New York saying, we, we don't have the bandwidth anymore. And New York started complaining saying, what do we do with these people? So Texas can't absorb any more right now. They can't handle it. So they lock the gates. Their National Guard comes in and establishes a border. And yet Border Patrol themselves, which is DHS, came in and un locked the gates and greeted them in. That video is available as well. Now, this is interesting. I went ahead and, and searched here, United States, a failed state. And the answer I got back was not. And then I had to click to find further. I just thought that was very interesting where this came from. 
and I didn't click on this site. Um, I'm not encouraging you to do that. I don't know anything about them, but I did take time to copy this because it says the United States is not a failed state. It is something much more disturbing. It is a society that has the means, but has decided not to try. This is what we're being told in our manipulation. Really? You're not gonna work for me as a slave? Really? You're not gonna pay taxes? Really? You're not gonna do what I told? This is your fault, you're not trying. Enough with the gaslighting. It says here, failed states lack the resources, equipment, and government capacity. Hasn't it been taken from us? Shut down? Supply chain locked in our homes? You try to get around it and you're arrested? To provide public safety and public services. And as we have seen over the last two and a half years, but specifically over the last two and a half weeks, the number of states or recognized governments that have absolutely collapsed. So I do agree that in, in the overall notion, we are not quite a failed state. But wow, we sure mimic the third world countries. And I don't know from one day to the next when this description is going to shift. We're pretty darn close there. So again, I want to bring you back to the United States Constitution. The preamble really sets the stage. It also, line by line, is what's being ripped apart. So I want to turn here to the story of David, Psalm 23. But before we step into this, I want to talk a little bit about David. This is the same David of David and Goliath. Now, we all, we've all heard that story, one version or another, little guy beats big guy. And I bring this up because there's, there's, two, there's two big lessons here, one with David and Goliath. Goliath, people like the story, but who's being the David? We, we do have one that stands up, correct? And he is being slaughtered. We've got others standing up. And they're constantly being attacked. Swatted has become the thing to do. Removed and removed from the planet. This leadership is not welcomed unless you're part of the club. And as we discussed yesterday, playing by the playbook. So David, as a very young boy, and we don't know exactly how old he is, but he was fairly young because he had, I think it was eight older brothers and they were not old enough to join the army. And yet David showed up and he says, I'm gonna do it. And it's a very, very interesting story as he has to win the battle within himself, knowing that he has the strength because he's following God's word. And it is not because of him, it is again because of God, standing up in front of his, his um, siblings who say, oh, that's really cute, but go home but standing firm, standing up in front of King Saul, who says, okay, fine, but put on this armor and take this sword. And David's like a little kid. I don't know how to use that thing. And then standing up against Goliath himself. And we know that it doesn't matter when he stood up in front of Goliath and he had his little bag of rocks on one side and his slingshot on another. It did not matter if he totally threw it in the wrong direction. He knew that this was God's battle. He knew that God would direct this in the way that it needed to be directed. In theory, that rock could have slid around the earth and come on back and hit him in the side of the head. But it would have hit the target. And this was not for David, but for God. And David believed and allowed God to show the world. And then of course the story continued there, but I wanna move forward a little bit to the 23rd Psalm. This is the famous, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm gonna read a few pages here out of the book that is by R.B. Theme Jr. Psalm 23. And this is an organization that openly prints these I think the last one that I had here was from 1977. You can find them at rbthieme.org. They're in Texas. And I think there's a um, 
you know, they do prayer and, and they have a series of books that they make available for free. So I'm going to read this section here. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou dost prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemy. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. What a blessing. And my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The 23rd Psalm was written by David during one of the darkest hours in his life. Not only had he experienced the unfaithfulness of many of his friends, but now Absalom, his beloved son, his son, had rebelled against him. Absalom had driven David from his palace in Jerusalem into the wilderness, forcing him to flee for his life. David had no army with him. He had nothing but a few faithful followers with only the clothes on their backs and a few provisions. They literally grabbed stuff on the way out the door and ran. In the midst of these, this disaster, David appeared to have lost everything. His crown. Remember, this was King David. His own son had betrayed him and driven him out. His wealth, he left everything behind. His friends, his loved ones, everything that he had near and dear to him, he lost. Yet in reality, he had lost nothing. As David retreated from Jerusalem over the brook Kidron, up the Mount of Olives, and into the wilderness of Judah, he recalled the Bible doctrine in his soul and wrote these 12 magnificent, magnificent lines of Hebrew poetry. Psalm 23 records David's journey into his own death shallowed valley and gives insight into how a mature believer triumphs over suffering and tragedy. Disasters in life do not change the blessing of the believer who continues to advance spiritually. If anything, blessings are increased. In Psalm 23, David recognized that God had a plan for his life. He knew this and that all was not lost. These words of comfort had meaning for David in the in what was known as the Absalom Revolution and have application for us as believers living today. Every line in this sacred poem, this divine message, is a remarkable statement of God's grace policy toward the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the policy. The believer can never earn or deserve anything from God. It's not based on what you do, your actions, how you, what you, it's not. God blesses in grace and God disciplines in grace. All blessings come from God, and all punishments come from God. Our lives never depend on who or what we are, but on who and what Christ is. This psalm is a testimony to grace, grace orientation told through three metaphors. Now, remember when I told you a little bit about David with the David and Goliath, I, I pointed out and reminded you that he had to, within himself, know that he was trusting God. 
he had to convince his brothers that he was trusting God and could do this. He had to talk to the king and tell the king that he was the right person and he was going to go without the sword or the, the armor. And in front of Goliath, he had to stand firm and let God work through him. Each one of those battles was fought three before even the final step before Goliath. And here in the psalm, we're learning that these three metaphors, the shepherd and the sheep, and you'll notice that as a young boy, David was a shepherd. He, in fact, left his sheep when he ran up to, to battle Goliath. He left his sheep alone. He was a shepherd. And then the second metaphor, the host and the guest. And the third, the military pursuit. So I'll read this one more time. Psalm 23, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads, beside, he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yeah, though I walk through the shadow, through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff shall comfort me. Thou shalt prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will rest in the house of the Lord forever. May God continue to bless America. And may America continue to serve God. Amen.